marched, we picketed, we made signs, we held meetings, we held each other up. We prayed and we searched for a candidate to run on the Democratic ballot in TA 18. During that time, we identified a number of worthy candidates, but in the end, we selected Gunnar Lamb as the candidate that we support. Tonight is your opportunity to learn why we are so excited to support Connor and to ask the questions about the things that you care about. Recently, I reread the obituary for Connor's grandfather, Tom Lamb, a well-known but humble politician in Pennsylvania for many years. My favorite line read as follows. He takes with him the institutional memory of a time when legislative anger had limits and compromise was preferable to conquest. And people worked harder to get something done than to take credit for it. Just the kind of politician that Connor Lamb will be. I give you Connor Lamb. Talked about 
changing the focus of the church to being more like a field hospital. Something that's mobile, something that's open to everybody, something that takes the problems as they are, no matter how bad they are, no matter how inconvenient they can be, no matter how late you have to stay up at night to solve them, but you get it done because people's lives and their futures are at stake. Uh, so when I talk about trying to solve the heroin epidemic, trying to take action and not just talk about it, when we talk about protecting Social Security and Medicare from the attacks that are coming from the other side, because those are things that people live on here in Western Pennsylvania from check to check. They're things that people pay for their entire lives. That's why I'm talking about those things. When I talk about sticking up for the members of our labor unions and the retired members of our labor unions, it's not because I read it in a book somewhere. It's because those people live here. They're our people. And they deserve to have someone fight for them in the halls of Congress. So that's what we're doing on this campaign. And what we're facing now in America is a public hypocrisy from the other side that is fully equal to the private hypocrisy of our predecessor in Congress, Representative Tim Murphy. We remember that in the last campaign, there was a lot of talk about jobs, the fact they promised us jobs. And now over a year later, they can't even introduce an infrastructure bill. The one thing that both the candidates agreed on last time, and the one thing that we know would create jobs here in Western Pennsylvania tomorrow. And it would improve our environment, make our businesses more competitive for years to come. They can't even introduce a bill. We remember that they promised us health care. Better health care than you've ever had before. But now what we see is every single time we turn around, they're trying to take health care away from someone. Heroin is a national emergency in our country. There are people dying here every single day, and they are trying to take health care away. And now after this tax bill is passed, we know that's not the only thing they're trying to take away. They've run up a trillion, trillion and a half dollars in debt, and the next day Paul Ryan and Marco Rubio come out, and they admit they want to engage now in what they call entitlement reform. What they're talking about is Social Security and Medicare. And from all the heads nodding in the room right now, I know that you already know that. The thing is, it just adds insult to injury when these politicians in Washington try to talk about that as entitlement reform like it's welfare or something that's undeserved. You pay that money into Social Security and Medicare your entire working lives. It's a promise we made to you as a society. I didn't serve in uniform overseas so that I could come home and take things away from my parents and grandparents. I did it to give something back. And so have all the other young veterans who are running for office right now. And I can tell you, if we come into office in 2018, we're not going to put up with that. We're going to fight for those two programs. Right now. now, we know now the reason that they think they can get away with this agenda, and it's because, at least here in Pennsylvania, we have an unconstitutional congressional map. The state Supreme Court has finally come out and said what many of us knew all along. And that's fine. When I left the U.S. Attorney's Office, a job that I love, I didn't care about those maps. And I can tell you now, having been traveling around the district for the last four months, our people don't care about the maps either. They didn't draw those maps. The Republicans in Harrisburg had to bring in a computer program called Red Map in order to come up with what we saw on those maps. So those maps aren't solving anybody's problems. But in this campaign, we will fight for every single vote all throughout the 18th Congressional District. And at the end of it, there will be no doubt in the minds of our people who actually sticks up for the working families and the middle class families of this district. And that's me and my campaign.
I just want you to know that I think we all share that same feeling right now, that when we do gather together, as Kevin said, uh, we all come away with more than we came in. So with that, we'll start with questions. Thank you. Microphone watcher. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask people who want to ask a question to go against that wall. And uh, one bonus for anybody standing is that to stand. You get to ask your question first if you like it. So we'll, we'll, we'll line up and go to the front. Come up. Um, when it's your turn, you'll be directed to the microphone. What we're going to ask is that you know you try to take about 30 to 45 seconds maximum to ask your question. Um, you're welcome to stay of view, um, but we're also going to ask that you not make any long political statements or statement of positions. You know, just get to your point and uh, answer your question. Then we're gonna ask you to sit down. Um, and there, there isn't gonna be any follow-up questions. So Dan, I could ask you, go ahead and get the people in the line, move them up uh, just in front of that step. Maybe we'll just have people stand in front of the step. Uh, Connor's gonna be willing to stand here. Um, as long as people are standing over there. So you, the line doesn't have to get excessively long. Once you see the line go down a little bit, you're welcome if you have another question to go head up. Um, and again, if you, need a, if you need an index card, if you're thinking of a, of a question while you're sitting there, just raise your hand. There's some people. Uh, there are some index cards. You're welcome to run them down. And then we're going to go. So with that, we'll open it up and uh, the one on both sides of the microphones you just have to be close to the microphone for it to pick you up Connor, uh, my name is uh, Mike Stout and I'm a retired steel worker 38 years in the steel workers union and 24 years in the musicians union I know all about the need for jobs and industrial manufacturing jobs in this area and I watched the plant get shut down that I worked at and 8,000 people lose their jobs. With that in mind, we got a problem in this area, and it's a big problem, and I wanna know what your answer is uh, and what you're gonna do about it, is we've got a situation here where we have nine billion tons of sewage, raw sewage that's being dumped into our rivers and into our streams. We have fracking wells that are being set up everywhere, which could have a position for or against drill and I don't care, but what I want to know about is what your position is on water. Because what's happened with these fracking companies and these gas companies that have come into this area, they've been exempted through the Halliburton loophole from the Clean Water Act, Clean Drinking Water Act, and the Clean Air Act. So my question to you is, and, and this is a personal issue for me, I got a daughter-in-law younger than you who's dying of stage four cancer. I got three friends who have kids younger than you that are dying of stage four cancer. My question is, are you gonna to go to Congress and fight to reverse and get these people out who crawl underneath the Halliburton loophole and get them to uphold the law and protect our water? Thanks, Mike. The answer is yes, I will. So let me uh, expound on that for a second. I just left the Department of Justice after being there for three years uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office downtown. And one day, about a year ago, I got a call from an EPA agent uh, who was coming to investigate the trucks that many of the natural gas companies use. Uh, they have these sensors on them to control the amount of exhaust that they're allowed to put into the air. And, you know, no surprise because of how unregulated many of them are. Uh, one of the companies figured out how to rig the sensors so it would be cheaper and easier for them to keep these trucks moving. So the EPA caught on to this to their credit, and they needed to come out and do a few search warrants. I was the guy that got the call. So uh, I did violent crimes and heroin. I had no idea uh, how to help an EPA agent with one of these things. So I started asking around the office, and it turned out nobody in my office had ever dealt with the EPA before either. And so when the agent got here, I said, uh, hey, none of us have ever heard from you before. You're the federal government too. What's going on? Well, the EPA has no criminal agents stationed in Western Pennsylvania. This guy was coming all the way from Philadelphia because he had caught on to the statewide scheme that was going on. Um, we have like the Saudi Arabia of natural gas here in Western Pennsylvania, and we don't have an EPA criminal agent. Well, guess what? Now we know that was a system or a symptom of a disease of under-regulation and enforcement that's been going on for a long time. If you've been following what's happening to the EPA in Washington, they're kicking out career scientists. 
You know, science has always been something that Republicans and Democrats agreed should actually take place as a pro process. And then we might disagree over how much regulation to have, but you gotta have the basic science first. Um, that isn't happening as much anymore, and if I went to Congress, that would be one of the first things I'd vote to change. The same thing has happened at the state level here in Pennsylvania. Uh, at our office opening a couple weeks ago, the head of the Westmoreland County DEP office came, and he told me that his budget and staff have been cut by 40% in the last 10 years. So they can't respond to calls. You know, if there's an open water frack pond and it stinks and it's ruined somebody's neighborhood, and the neighbors start calling the office, there aren't as many people there to come check it out as there were before. And I think that's a surprise to people when I tell them that all over the district, because people think they deserve a government that they pay for. They deserve a watchdog, a cop on the beat, on the environment. And they don't have it a lot of times now, and that's something we need to change. So I am with you on that one. But I think the number one issue is the need to invest in infrastructure. And that means around here, around here, it really means roads and bridges. So, you know, Pittsburgh likes to call itself the city of bridges. Well, 30% of our bridges are structurally deficient. And so if you're Amazon or any other company that relies a lot on trucking and moving around goods uh, to get to market, are you gonna have the confidence to spend a lot of money here on building a plant and sending trucks here and hiring drivers if you know that one out of every three bridges is something you don't want to be driving on. Uh, if you need to drive on our roads and you know that we have a Southern Beltway project with a lot of promise to alleviate the congestion in other corridors, but we haven't fully funded a huge chunk of it and that work is undone, are you gonna have the confidence to invest here as a business person? What about if you're a young man or woman coming out of high school in the next couple of years and you want to work with your hands and you want to join the building trades and maybe even a union? If there's no public works being done, uh, you'll have fewer opportunities to work, even though those unions have the capacity to train people right now. And even though when we do federal infrastructure projects, we pay people a prevailing wage and make sure that they can actually sustain themselves and a family on those jobs. So that's the importance of infrastructure, and that's why in the last presidential campaign, both candidates agreed on it and talked about how we needed a big infrastructure proposal. And the American Society of Civil Engineers says the same thing, that we're $3 trillion behind before we even get to the next trillion that'll get us ready for the 21st century as an economy you know, to keep leading the world. So that's where I would start. The president has said that he's for it, and I've said repeatedly that I'd love to work with the president on the infrastructure program if they would propose one and allow Congress to vote. Already have jobs. 
So I'd like to know what your position on the $15 minimum wage and how can you make sure that working people can make ends meet? I'm fully committed to making sure that people who work hard are able to take home enough pay to feed themselves and their families. Uh, I have not yet been convinced that we need one minimum wage to apply everywhere. Uh, the 18th Congressional District, in fact, is a decent example of how that can be tough. You know, it can be too hard to, to tell a small business owner down in Green County that they need to pay the same minimum wage as people in the city of Pittsburgh or in Manhattan or some place like that. Uh, I don't think that the economic impact of that might be as good as a system of policies that you know allow the conditions to fluctuate a little bit. We should raise the minimum wage, don't get me wrong, uh, but it probably would be something that would be indexed a little more to the geography. Um, while at the same time exploring the expansion of policies like the earned income tax credit that allow people who work hard to keep more of their pay uh, and not doing things like the tax bill that was just passed last, uh, at the end of last year, which gave 80% of the cost of that bill to the 1% in big corporations. And the people who really need relief, uh, the people whose wages are worth less and less every day are the people in the middle class and the working class, just because of the way our economy is changing. I think that's where we need to focus our, our efforts as, as legislators. My name is Tom Mack, I'm from Boston, China, PA. Uh, I first want to just make a comment that your opponent has shown us good character right out the gate by the negative TV, no issues, just a tax. I really pray that you stay above the fray, keep it on issue, and show your true character because his true character is coming through really loud. Well. Uh, my question is we live in Castle Shannon. Castle Shannon is trying to become a team of transportation over the area like rail. What uh, plans do you have any plans to assist Castle Shannon in fulfilling uh, uh, in the goal of the federal infrastructure? I'd be happy to look at any proposal uh, that supported the T. I myself am a dedicated T rider for many years, uh, so it's a very important thing to, to me as well. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the logic speaks for itself. You can walk to the T from a lot of locations. It, I'm sure, is much more environmentally friendly than having all these people commute on in cars and it clears up traffic on our roads. There's, there's a lot of great uh, benefits. So if we were able to make that part of the federal infrastructure program, I think that'd be a great idea. For, for everybody coming up, you really need to be close to this mic, and you need to shout into it. So anybody asking a question, please shout. People cannot hear you. I'm Tom Kennedy, I'm Washington County, Peters Township. Healthcare is a very complex issue. Do you believe that everyone should have health care? And do you believe that the Affordable Care Act can be fixed or needs to be scrapped and redone. Thank you. Uh, I do believe that everybody has the right to affordable health care. When, when somebody's sick, they have to be able to go to the doctor. It's just that simple in America today. Uh, I do think we start with fixing the Affordable Care Act. You know, we're going to have to undo a fair amount of damage when we're able to get started on that project. Uh, the administration and the leaders in Washington right now have really hollowed out the many of the provisions of that act that were there to make premiums more affordable. So they've cut the subsidies, they've cut into the funds that were available to market the, the exchanges and bring more people into the pools. Obviously the mandate was taken away, the tax bill at the end of the year. Uh, all these things are just gonna inject more uncertainty into the insurance markets and they're gonna make people's premiums go up. I saw one analysis that said premiums went up again in Pennsylvania by an average of 30% this past year. Uh, that's not good enough, we can do better, but we have to make the insurance markets stable, make sure they have the funding they need, and then I think we do have to look at some new provisions because even when the ACA was functioning under President Obama, there were a lot of places in this country that only had one insurer covering them, you know, and companies didn't wanna enter the marketplace everywhere. So we have to look at things like reinsurance, for example, to make sure that when we're asking companies to cover these really high-risk pools, like people with pre-existing conditions, uh, that they have the, the certainty to know they can plan for that over time. It's really difficult to plan the cost for those people. But we've made our commitment as a society to protect people with pre-existing conditions. I am fully committed to that. But what's gonna happen now as a result of them playing around with the ACA is those premiums are gonna go up and up and up. And there's no guarantee in the law that that, that uh, health insurance has to be affordable 
for people with pre-existing conditions, just that it has to be there. And that's not good enough. We have to protect those people and make sure their health care is important. Manzur Mohideen from Dead Person Health. Uh, uh, I know I met you before, it's the first time I'm meeting you, but yet I've started campaigning for you with the hope that you will pay for, uh, uh, for the community. Now, there have been 70,000 more Democrats registered during the last elections, and yet Trump won by over 26% in this district. Uh, my question to you is this What are your strategies? Uh, then you're running against a fellow who says he's been Trump more so than Trump became. Uh, he was he is Trump long before Trump became Trump. Okay? And now he seems like a Trump incarnate or even worse. So my question to you is, I want you to win, therefore what is your strategy to win back all those Democrats to to our fall and uh, you win the election? Well it sounds to me that my opponent is running for President Trump and for Paul Ryan. I'm running for the people of the 18th. So whether you call that a strategy or just a basic commitment of mine, uh, I am all over this district every day. I try not to leave it unless I absolutely have to. And what we're finding is this. Uh, in most of our district, there are plenty of Democrats holding office. They're county commissioners, they're sheriffs, they're judges, district attorneys, you name it. They elect Democrats, no problem. But Democrats seeking national office, for whatever reason, haven't campaigned in many of these places as much in the past. There hasn't been enough healthy competition. So what I'm starting with is just going down and meeting people and walking around with Pam Snyder in Greene County, Ted Kopis in Westmoreland County, and Harlan Schober and Larry Maggi in Washington County. And we're meeting people and talking about basic issues, like how we need to rebuild our roads and bridges. And people are responding to it. And that's why you're seeing more and more what we've known for some time, which this race is a dead heat. And we are bringing healthy competition to this district for the first time in a long time. And on March 13th, we're we'll going to see the results. My name is Jake Sadlitsky, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just wondering if we're going to have the opportunity to see you and Rick Sakun square off in a debate sometime. I, I certainly hope so, sir, and uh, I don't see him here tonight, though. Um, you know, I, I assume he was probably invited just like I was. And I know that there have been discussions taking place between both campaigns. My campaign has said over and over again that we'll accept any debate. I haven't heard the same thing from the other side yet. So maybe many of our friends in this room can, you know, add to the groundswell that we're seeing for a new candidate. We can we can add to that uh, the demand for debates, and maybe that'll have some impact. Thank you, ma'am. I really decided to enter this race because for the last three years of my life, I've been prosecuting heroin traffickers and sitting across the table from parents that lost their kids. And when I did that, time and time again, people would look at me and often the son or daughter that they lost might have been around my age. And they'd be thankful for what we were doing in law enforcement and happy that we were going after the dealer that killed their son or daughter. Uh, but there was just a look in their eye that said, they had given up, and they really didn't believe that those of us in the government could do much for them anymore, that we had failed and we couldn't protect people anymore. Uh, and you tell that to a Marine officer, that's like a set of marching orders. I know it's not true. None of this was inevitable. We know now how it started, largely with prescription painkillers, uh, and we know that if we make a serious commitment to providing rehabilitation centers, putting beds for people to sleep in, giving people the insurance they need to stay in those beds, not for 30 days, but for 60 days and 90 days, and get the follow-up care that they need, not for months, but for years, and get the medication that they need, in addition to that outpatient treatment, that we can save lives. We can move the needle from 5% success rate to 20% success rate, and that'll save tens of thousands of lives every year. If instead we do what many of our elected leaders have done, is hold press conferences and then do nothing, we will lose 300,000 people in the next five years. 300,000. The types of numbers that used to be talked about in World War I and the Civil War. That's 
that's not acceptable, and that will blow a hole in my generation. So if there is one thing I can commit to working on in Congress and demanding action on from the day I get there to the day I leave, it's the heroin epidemic. But then they're happy to try to privatize it at the same time. That's not the answer. If there's one commitment we know we should make as a society, and it has to be a public commitment and a public investment, it's to take care of those who are born the cost of life. And the American people are way past their elected leaders on this issue. They want it done. 
They want us to vote on it and move on. That's the job of the people that we send to Washington. And my answer to those who are skeptical of Senator McConnell is, okay, if he breaks his promise, treat him like any of them that break their promises, throw them out, and let's send some new people to Africa. So many of you might remember in the last campaign, there was one candidate who said over and over again that he was for coal and he was for the coal workers, right? <laughs> uh, well, since then, we've seen coal plants continue to close, including here in Western Pennsylvania. And there has been a bill sitting in the House and a bill sitting in the Senate to guarantee the, poten the pensions of our retired coal miners. And that's not just because that's supposed to make everybody feel good, it's because our government made a promise to those people back in the 60s that if they underwent the hard and difficult work of mining for coal because our country really needed it, it was important to our national security, that we would always be there for them. And their pension was something that we could guarantee. And then a lot of the companies that they went for, or that they worked for, have declared bankruptcy and tried to get out of that commitment. So what these bills would do is make sure that if absolutely necessary, we would use treasury funds to make sure that these people get their pensions. Uh, I said from the beginning of my campaign that of course I'm in favor of those two bills. We keep our promises when we come. Those two bills were pushed by Senator Bob Casey and Senator Joe Manchin. And many on the right, including those in the White House, have not lifted a finger to get those done. So they're languishing on Capitol Hill, but I will do everything I can to push them along, Dan. Uh, when it comes to retraining, I think we all know that there are gonna be different economic opportunities today and tomorrow than there were in the past. The problem is that many of our job training programs in the past have been designed to produce a piece of paper and not much else. So we need to change that system to where if the government is going to shoulder the burden of job training, which I'll be happy to do, it's going to end in a job. And the companies who come out every year and talk about how they don't have the skilled workforce that they need will be compelled if they want to accept citizens trained to the max by public dollars and to the best standard they can imagine, they will take those people in a job, whether it's in the form of an apprenticeship program like Germany and Japan do, or some other form, but we have the tools to do that. We just have to have the political will to get it done. It would seem that they made a deal with Trump to get a huge tax cut, which will result in deficits that are gonna end up cutting Medicare, Social Security, and social things like this. And what do you intend to do about taking the power from the families, these the Koch brothers and other families, and putting them back into the people? The answer to that one is simple, and uh, the power is right here in this room, and it's in every room that I go to on this campaign. I mean, tonight was sold out, not because I'm so great, it's because all, all of you are coming together to demand change. And that's happening all over this district, and I keep telling people, let all the super PACs come in on the other side. Let them spend every last cent on this race so they don't have any more to spend, although that would take a long time, of course. Uh, but th this is something that money can't buy, and there's a reason we have hundreds of people knocking on doors for our campaign every weekend and making phone calls every night. And while we've already contacted over 18,000 voters since the first of the year, you know, I mean, it's because of all of you, and we're seeing it all over the place, and I guarantee you that's what will lead to success on March 13th, no matter what the Koch brothers or anyone else have to say about it. Since 2010, the Democrats have lost 12 state governorships, they've lost 700 legislative seats nationwide, they lost both houses of Congress in three out of four national elections. What's being done to stop the bleeding? I know you're gonna win here in PA, but what's being done to stop the bleeding nationwide? I, 
think it's simple. New people are stepping up to run for office. And if we have enough of those, that's where we change it. I'd love to have you join me in the next campaign, my friend. Cut right to the chase then. Um, how will you encourage the development of business here and elsewhere while also paying for the increase in social programs that you previously mentioned in your responses? So it helps to step back and remember that back in December, the Republicans had no problem passing a tax cut bill that had a one and a half trillion dollar price tag at least. That's what we can estimate now. No one really knows if it could be more than that. No problem with that at all. Uh, so the party that used to stand for being fiscally conservative and responsible has pretty much abandoned that. Uh, on the other side, you can look at the things that we're advocating. So take infrastructure as an example. Interest rates are at pretty much an all time low in this country. It's the perfect time to finance infrastructure spending. Infrastructure is something that we know pays for itself and leads to economic benefits. It has since the beginning of the republic. That's not just a, a failed theory and argument, the way that trickle-down economics is and how something that's been advanced many times in the last 30 years and has never worked has instead just added more and more to debt every time. Instead, the railroads, the interstate highway system, all the big infrastructure investments that we've made have, as a country have allowed us to make a lift. And the other big ingredient in that equation is public education. Those are the things that we know, without a doubt, have made our country what it is. We need to get back to that and really invest in the building blocks of our society. And if we do that, it will create jobs, it will make our economy better, and it will bring our budget back into balance. Well, I won't, I won't call them the opposition because I don't see them that way, but, uh, you know, for me, what, what makes me so certain of it is my experience in the Marine Corps. Uh, because most of the people that I served with in the Marines were from small towns, they were from what the media likes to call red states. Many of them would be registered as Republicans, although a lot of Marines are independents. They're a very special breed, if anyone here uh, goes a Marine. And we'd have long discussions, you know, President Obama had just started his term when I went into officer training in 2009. A lot of the guys I served with didn't like President Obama. He was our commander in chief, so we talk about it all the time. But neither of us ever shouted at each other, and when the discussion was over, and we had to go out and complete a mission or do whatever we had to do together, we always did it, and we worked together great. So you can talk to people about things you disagree with, at least in the military culture, that always ends with some positive action. We're gonna advance the ball. I mean, they teach us in training to always have a bias for action, you know? I mean, I can't just sit around and allow things to go undone. And there's a lot of veterans running for office right now who share the same mentality. There's a lot of business owners running for office right now who think the same thing on both sides. So I have a feeling that we'll find each other across the aisle. Uh, I also think it takes a little courage to reach across the aisle, to compromise, to be pragmatic. You know, many of the senators that were involved in resolving the government shutdown this past weekend have gotten beaten up from members of their own party for being willing to compromise with the other side. Uh, but Andrew Jackson said that a man with courage makes a majority. I would update that and say a person with courage makes a majority because those negotiations were led largely by Senator uh, Olympia Snow, or Susan Collins, I'm sorry. But, um, you know, I just think that if we send enough new people to Washington who are courageous enough to reach out, despite the fact that that doesn't always look good and it's not easily explained to the media, we can start changing things. Again. Domestically here, I think a good example of where our basic commitments need to be is 
the free and reduced lunch program in our public schools. So we know, for example, that a lot of public schools engage in basically lunch shaming. They make it hard for kids who are eligible for that part of the program to take advantage of it. Some schools do extremely well. Uh, one thing that I would pay close attention to if I could go to Congress is ways that we can make sure that every school does it well. Because if there's one thing we know is that hungry kids won't learn. They can't learn. So we need to fix that. Thank you very much, ma'am. And I'll just add to that um, that I'm a candidate that's been endorsed by a group called End Citizens United, which is a great organization that you should all look into that is committed to changing the campaign finance system. I think we all know the campaign finance system is not good. Uh, so one thing I've decided was that I'm not going to accept money from corporate PAC political activists. <laughs> Groups like NCC United exist to help citizens get together to make up the difference that political candidates leave on the table when they decide to do something like that. So thank you all who have supported my campaign so far, and you've made it possible for us to stake out a position on campaign finance that is bold, that's new. A lot of candidates aren't doing it, but we think it's time for change. Connor, my name is Myra, and I'm one of many Pittsburghers who trained with Al Gore this past fall. And I learned that our environment right here in Pittsburgh is one of the worst in the country. Our air conditions, the conditions of what we breathe, and I happen to be one of many with a touch of asthma, and you look every day at, at the Clareton Works and the plans to build that uh, plant in Beaver County, it's going to set us back 20 years. What are you going to do to support, to defend us against climate change and pollution? So I'm going to make sure that we have cops on the beat for the environment. I've talked about that a lot. I also think we need to talk about longer term how seriously we need to commit to the basic science that will allow us to have a clean energy future. Uh, we know that those jobs are going to be there. We know that China is investing more than us right now in many of the technologies and most of the basic science. And I don't want to lose that race to China. I don't want my kids' generation to lose that race to China. Uh, I want those jobs here. I want Americans making solar panels and all the others. I want them leading the way in green building technology. Uh, and I want that done here in Western Pennsylvania, including by members of our unions. So we can do that, uh, but we have to commit to it. Sorry uh, to double up on you, uh, but I, I worked with your uh, uncle before you were born, so you said I could, so. <laughs> Connor, there's a lot of us out there. Uh, we love the Warriors, uh, and we support anybody uh, and the Warriors that are defending us against terrorism. But the fact of the matter is, we're fighting a lot of wars out there that don't have a damn thing to do with terrorism. And I'll give you one example. We just gave $130 billion to Saudi Arabia to wage a war in Yemen that's uh, endangered seven million people starving to death because we joined the Saudis 
in a uh, naval blockade that prevented food from going in there. We bombed their hospitals, our planes, with Saudi Arabian pilots, bombed their schools, and we're jet fuel, and we're supplying the planes over there, and we're fighting a war that has nothing to do with fighting terrorism. We got defense contractors that are getting rich that have nothing to do with terrorism. We're spending a trillion dollars on nuclear weapons. People in this country, I speak for millions of people, we're getting sick of wars that have nothing to do with terrorism, and I want to know what you're going to do to go there. We support, we love the warrior. What are you going to do to stop these wars and de-escalate this international situation? I, mean, I don't know the, the choice to de-escalate. I don't know if that's always up to us. Uh, you know, someone I look up to a lot is now Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis. Uh, he was in uniform when I was in the Marines. Uh, he has already started shifting the defense focus now to China and Russia and the great world powers. So I think a lot of this is going to happen on its own as we look for the fights that are coming um, and the preparation that we need to be successful. Uh, that said, you know, I'm a military lawyer, and I served in uniform with a lot of people who are extremely committed to human rights and the rule of law. And I have a lot of faith in the role of our, that our troops play everywhere in the, the world that they go uh, in upholding those two things. So to the extent that your question was implying that we're doing things around the world uh, that you shouldn't be proud of, that hasn't been my experience, and I don't know that it's true. So I think that as long as we make sure we focus our military investment on the biggest problems that we have, uh, the Marines especially are going to do what it takes to be successful. Hi, my name is Lisa. I'm from Peters Township, slightly south of here. Um, my question, or the statement and the question is, all of these ideas are fabulous and these are things we're all concerned about. But in order to make this happen, people need to go out and vote. Vote. So, with that said, said I am the mom of four. Two of them are college students. Um, is there... <laughs> You can say, okay, an absentee ballot. Okay, we did that. Get the absentee ballot. Have it sent to them. Have them sign it. Have them send it back out. These are college students. Uh, I don't know about anybody out here. Do you think in the foreseeable future or in the fantasy future there might be a way to start changing things like this? Changing Tuesdays when people are working. It's so difficult for a lot of working individuals to get to the polls. Will there ever, ever be another way to vote, especially for those college kids? I'm interested in all those ideas, and I think that's where the role of cities and counties and states as laboratories of democracy comes into play, and there are states in our country that do it differently and that allow early voting. Uh, voting is something that has always been controlled and left to the states under our Constitution and system of law. Uh, so I would uphold that, and I would encourage experimentation whenever we could. My name is Shari, and I live in Mount Lebanon. Um, the arts play a huge role in the health of our economy. We have some of the best arts organizations in the country right here. Many of you may not know that. We all know they're great sports organizations. But we have a world-class opera, a world-class symphony, and a world-class ballet. All of these institutions help to feed the economy of the region by having people come in, in the restaurants, sometimes stay in hotels. Um, we, the, the people that are downtown need that business. So what are you, in the face of potential cuts to the NEA, um, and there are other state cuts happening as well to the arts, but what would you be willing to do to help the economy on that level? I'm, I'm well aware of the impact that the arts have on our economy here in Western Pennsylvania especially, and I don't want to see any cuts to the NEA, at least right now. Um, I haven't seen a proposal why that would be necessary, especially when we can find plenty of money to give, keep corporate loopholes open, and allow companies to move jobs overseas and cut the top, top income rate from 39 to 37%. So uh, I, I would like to keep those where they are and, and allow the benefits to keep flowing to everybody. Thank you. Um, uh, a lot of my, many of my relatives are Republican or, uh, and vote Republican for one reason only, and that is because they are pro-life, uh, anti-abortion. And I see that um, as really, and I know there's a lot of there's a lot of area that you can go on this, but I, um, you know, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm concerned that my candidate, I want to make sure that they're eloquent to have a discussion about it in a forum that doesn't seem like the Democrats are compromising their values because they're pro-choice. Pro 
and I just kind of wanted to hear your your take on uh, on Yes, yeah, thanks for asking, because uh, I get that question a lot. I know it's on people's minds. I'm a Catholic, and I have a personal religious belief that life begins at conception. Uh, but I'm also an American, and I believe in the separation of church and state. So a woman's right to choose is the law here in the United States. Uh, I will uphold and defend that law. I don't believe that I can impose my religious belief through the law. We've never done that. Um, the church has never compelled that. And I think that other people of faith see this question a little bit differently. And, you know, to go back to what I was saying at the beginning, the quote from Rabbi Heschel, I think this is a great example. Uh, there are plenty of brothers and sisters of mine who are Jewish, who are Muslim, who don't see this issue the same way. And I think one of the things that has made us truly great as a country is the fact that we allow the difference for different religious views. We're going to be wrapping this up, so if you have a burning question, we have got two or three more questions. Um, and then we're going to wrap it up. So if you want to ask a question, please come up now. And, and I'll just say, I'm not going to be hard to find. If you don't get your question uh, tonight, we've got plenty of public events. You'll notice a contrast between me and my opponent uh, in that regard. And if I am fortunate enough during your vote to be elected, uh, I've already said over and over again that I'll have regular town halls. Uh, we always do. damages that have been done in this last year is that our standing in the world has just plummeted. People aren't even visiting the United States now. Uh, our leaders are being ignored in many places. Everyone's trying to get around working with the United States rather than working with the United States. I would be interested in terms of, I understand as a congressman, you couldn't by yourself, you couldn't do one of them, but I certainly like your attitudes on that. Right, I think, you know, we have to get back to the school of thought that, again, used to be bipartisan, the whole idea of speak softly and carry a big stick, right? I mean, we have to be ready for war even if it comes, or for conflict when it comes. Uh, but I think the reason that we have the respect of the world for so long is because of the way we conducted ourselves, you know? We were there when the big crises arose to take action, and we made the public investments that made people want to come here, and people still want to come here. We have the best system of higher education in the world. We need to protect that. We need to allow the people that come here and want to stay when they've got gained all that knowledge and create businesses that will create jobs for our kids. We need to let them stay. Uh, you know, China is filling a void left by us right now on the world stage. When it comes to public investment, for example, their One Belt, One Road project is going to be seven times the size of the Marshall Plan when they get it done. Uh, they're not doing that to be nice. They're doing it because it's in their economic interest. We have to do things that are in the economic interest of our people. But one of those things is to invest publicly here in a way that can create jobs and make us so dynamic and competitive again that everyone's going to want to come here to start their businesses. Hi, Connor. My name is Peter Swindoll, and I'm a freshman at Mount Lebanon High School, just more here. Um, after the recent FCC ruling or repeal net neutrality laws, my school and I'm sure many others were buzzing on our generation and that's so much. Literally bugging. Yeah. 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 Um, how will you fight to defend our free minutes? I think that decision on net neutrality was a mistake, and uh, there's a lot of good proposals from smart people in the House and Senate right now to fix it, and I'd be in favor of one of those for sure. So I understand you're probably in favor of increasing education funding, but do you believe that standards should be set by the federal government or by state governments with regards to what students learn in their schools? Uh, you know, I think we've, we've made some progress in finding a balance there. So I know toward the end of the Obama administration, for example, uh, they were able to pass some laws that returned even more control in the states. I think that's fine. Uh, I think we need to make sure we meet the situation for what it is. We know in the future that we just need to invest in economic growth in schools. We need to invest in our special education programs, free and reduced type lunch programs. Those people have the ones they need to be successful. Uh, I'm really concerned about that side of it, making sure that we have the most effective tools that we need to be successful. Uh, I guarantee the pensions of our teachers to make sure our teachers. I'm
we do that, I think a good teacher is the solution to most of these, uh, most of these problems that we have. So I think this is probably going to be our last session here, so, and make a good one. All right, Connor. Ed Eichelhoff. I'm also running for the House of Representatives for District 40 in this area, and I also work as a counselor at the county jail, and I'm seeing such an increase in the criminality uh, driven by the, uh, a lot of the, the drug crisis, mental health issues, but it's a huge uh, expense. We are the nation with the highest incarceration rate uh, and one of the lowest uh, re 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 recidivism uh, of criminals. And what I'd like to do is get a commitment from you to work to uh, amend and to uh, re re-energize our entire criminal justice system because it's a festering uh, mess of uh, people who get caught up in uh, a criminal element or a parking ticket or something and end up spending a ridiculous amount of taxpayer money in time uh, incarcerated. So, thank you. Thanks. My commitment is to reduce crime. Um, and I think there are a lot of important ways to do that. We should take a more public health approach to crime because it actually works. You know, what I saw from the inside is I didn't think we were good enough yet at targeting, really making sure 